Merkel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to call the Door County Board of Supervisors to order on Tuesday, February 25th at 10 a.m. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. <coughs> we, don't, we don't have all day. <laughs> she had two okay. you know, ready? No. After all this, we're going to sit. Got a rookie up there? After all this all. time? She has a later time? Call Barb. <laughs> Will you jump to the again? She's in screen. No, I didn't. Yeah, she did. That's what it is. Yeah. Thanks. 21 present. Thank you. Correspondence. I'm sorry. Presentation of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Correspondence. You'll notice you're on assigned fund balance. And the Northeast Wisconsin Technical College letter. When we come to public comment, I just want to let everybody know if there's anybody in the audience that was want to make a comment on the Yonkers building, we're going to plan on tabling that discussion for today. We don't have all of the final information that we want to discuss. Public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to make a comment? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Wolfel, and I'm the chairman for the town of Sebastopol, the lovely town of Sebastopol. Um, I'm here today because in your packet, there's some information regarding a piece of property that's been in our town for way too long called the Muscat property. I think you all have pictures of that. So I wanted to just give you a little background. I apologize for those of you who have heard it before uh, about that property and where it stands with the town and ask for your help. Um, these unsightly buildings have been in the town for a long, long time, and they are at the beginning of the Door County <coughs> Postal Byways. So they're in a very high traffic location. They're in our economic corridor. Uh, they're very public in terms of all the tourism the tourists that go by because it's just at the split of the 4257 interchange. Uh, so it does not present a great image, and it hinders our ability to do something economically in that area. Um, the town has been working for the last 15 years to try and remove these buildings through a number of, of, of actions, but have been unsuccessful up to this point. We are trying to get the tanks, the underground fuel tank removed, as well as have the buildings <coughs> worn down with the exception of the barn, which we believe uh, there's enough artists in the area that the barn could stand as is for a while. Uh, the former owner, Sylvia Muscat, passed away 20 years ago. She left the property to her son and daughter, and uh, they've paid taxes on it, and they've collected rents on the ag land. Um, the town has found out, found out over time that even though this property was left to Sylvia's uh, children over 20 years ago, they never took title to it. So the town funded uh, the legal process in order to get the uh, son and daughter declared the heirs to the property. We also funded the expense to go to the deal to, to the DNR to get a no liability letter from them with respect to the fuel tank that's in the ground. And we have been given documentation back that says we can remove these buildings one at a time or in total uh, as long as we do not go below grade or disturb anything within that area. At the same time, the Department of Justice is working to get the Muscat heirs to remove the fuel tank and the pump that's there. Um, so we've been chasing this thing for quite a while and have invested a fair, fair amount of money. The town currently has $25,000 set aside in this year's budget for the removal of some of those buildings. And in the packet that you see, we had each one of those buildings priced for demolition so that we could exercise the best use of our money to try and have the, the greatest impact. We may be able to move one, two, or whatever number of buildings over the course of the next few months, we hope. Um, uh, we've had the building, our building inspector has issued a raise order and the heirs have been, the heir, excuse me, has been served 
and they have a 30 day window with which to respond or we can then proceed to go to the court to start to raise those buildings. Um, we have gotten the estimates approximately totaling $60,000 to remove all of the buildings at one time. There is some economies of scale in that the asbestos removal people don't have to come on two or three different occasions and obviously equipment movement back and forth. So uh, we know what the cost might be. Um, our concern at the town is we have been chasing this fairly hard for the last number of years. The single remaining heir, the daughter, is uh, in her 80s. Her health is not the best, and we're trying to add the strike while the iron is hot before there's a change in ownership and a new set of heirs to perhaps deal with if she has a son and a daughter. So we're asking the, the county to partner with us to hopefully remove all these buildings in, a, in one fell swoop. Um, and I think the request was in there for approximately $30,000. And there's been some discussion among the various committees at the admin and finance with respect to the town's <coughs> request. And the way that the town anticipates getting its money back out of this process is through a special assessment on the tax rolls. And through whatever vehicle eventually we would get our money back and we would um, in turn fund the county. But in conversations what we want to do is if you'll partner with us, whatever monies come back through the sale or foreclosure on that property, we would pay back the county's portion of that first before the town takes anything. So if the property sells for 60000 we will give you back your 31st thing before the town gets a penny. Um, so we're looking to do this. We have limited budget. I, I don't want to, I would prefer not to have to take a building a year down for the next four years as we try and fund it through our internal budget. So I come to you with that ask. and. When it's appropriate, if there's any questions or whatever, I'd be happy to stay and answer them. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> My name is Christine Reed from Forestville. I live on the Forestville flowage. Good morning. I discovered this week that. Um, People in Southern Door are losing faith in public input, the democratic process, and rightfully so. I tried to get people to go to the uh, public input for the land and water 10-year um, planning session at the Brussels Town Hall, and they, the feedback that I got was they, they don't feel that they're going to be heard. And, uh, and use as an example the reason that they feel that way. They spoke out about the, the drawdown at the flowage and <coughs> in spite of <coughs> taking off work, coming to this board, speaking out, writing messages, signing petitions, they got the opposite. The opposite of what their public input was. And, and they're just lo losing faith. I want to uh, let you know that in addition to the uh, video that I sent to everybody on the board uh, recently of sediment being transferred, I was at the dam yesterday, sediment continues to transfer, and this morning it continues. So that is something that was <coughs> supposedly not going to happen and and it is and to me it is justification for going back to the drawing board I called Joel Kitchens and, and call in show to WDUR and I said what is the threshold to stop and take another look at it what are the missed critical milestones what is the threshold to say this isn't going exactly the way that we planned. We need to take another look at it. And he said that he was going to talk to you about it. So maybe somebody here can let me know uh, what that threshold is. Um, I want to point out again that spring is right around the corner. When temperatures rise above 50 degrees, the risk of health issues more specifically, blastomycosis, 
uh, will definitely be increased and elevated. And I've pointed it out many times, you didn't have that information at the time that you voted. Would you still vote yes, knowing that those serious health risks exist? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Good morning. Uh, Don Fricks, 8305 Quarter Line Road, Fish Creek. Um, Good morning. Expounding a little bit on the mill pond, I've got two answers when I ask the questions, uh, what's the public benefit? And uh, I haven't got any scientific data on the royal flush of the sediment that's gone out to Lake Michigan so far, and nothing more than vague generalizations on public benefits, so oh, the beach, so oh, this, so oh, that, so, oh, there might be fish here. Everything is kind of a wishful thinking, nothing, there's no data, no science. Uh, topic two, Door County Economic Development Corporation. Um, I've asked this before and suggested that we don't have any monetary interest money with them, uh, monetary interest with them until they seek to have labor representative. Where is labor not part of economic development? Okay. So, you know, we, we hear, oh, well, we're talking about what we're going to do for workforce housing. Where is the workforce involved in the decision making and the process? Um, number three, uh, solar, solar intra installations on Yonkers. I hear you say you don't have all the information, so I hope you're working on engineering cost benefit ratios for putting solar panels on the roofs down at Yonkers. And finally, um, Youth apprentice programs, I think they're a good idea on some levels, but I think these kids are too young to be taken out of high school when their uh, their focus should be in high school. If if this can't be done by uh, potential employers during summer employment like we did when we grew up, you know, you got a chance to try a trade or you have them here for the county, um, I, I just don't think it's a good idea to take any kids out of the high school environment during the school year. It's short enough, it's not focused enough, and I think uh, these kids' brains are still forming till they're, you know, 22, 25 years old, and uh, anyway, that's that's my point on that. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. <coughs> we'll now close public comment. Is there any supervisor response? Linda. I would just like to say that Mr. Wolfel and myself would be pleased to answer any and all questions on the intergovernmental agreement when we get to that point on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? We will move to the administrator's monthly report. <coughs> so it's, I guess right now I gave this kind of a presentation on the report last month. And now what you'll see is that each time it comes forward now, I will provide any updates as the projects come forward. Again, you'll see, obviously, some of these larger projects, you're not going to see any significant changes. But again, it's on the report. So if there isn't anything specific you'd like to discuss or have any questions, it is part of the report and we can discuss those. But again, this will be this kind of a standard format moving forward unless you have a different suggestion otherwise. Questions? David. Just a, a comment to the museum and archives uh, bullets that are there. <coughs> One indicates the museum and archives are under the library, and the next says the museum is will continue to stand alone. So the way I'm looking at it, it's a little contradictory. It's on page four. Yes, <coughs> and let me, let me clarify that because that's actually a good point, and I will change the wording on that. So the archives is actually, they're both, I guess, under the, I guess what I would consider under Tina in terms of management, as far as an org chart. Uh, again, but the museum itself statutorily has to remain independent of the library board. So the archives will report, I guess, structurally under the org chart to the library board, but the museum committee will still remain intact for the museum portion, although both of those are, I guess, under the, I guess, the direction of Tina as the library director. But I will, I will fix the wording on that, but that's a good thing to clarify. Dave. Along that topic, then, are we saying that the budget operations and everything is still going to stay the way it is? 
or are the <coughs> museum is the library board going to have authority over their budget the the entire budget for both of those departments will be under uh, Tina <clears throat> but again the museum will have the authority in terms of the museum portion of the budget but uh, as far as decide making decision making process you know that the museum was underneath um, the county board itself right mm -hmm. uh, does it sit underneath the library board then nope museum committee so the museum committee does not answer to the library board correct it answers to the county board like it that always is, has that is correct it has to statutorily well, I just wanted to clarify the budget aspect of it yep and that's not true that we have a higher number of civilians running that particular group okay Susan um, just a quick <coughs> clarification of library boiler I think uh, under status I'm assuming it really should say bids for the library boiler are due March 6th oh, yeah. is that accurate oh yeah. yes <laughs> that is correct that's what you get for cut and paste any other questions if that will move to the minutes approval of the minutes of January 28th 2020 County Board meeting motion to approve the minutes second any changes additions deletion <coughs> comments grammatical remarks other errors inclusion exclusion if not all in favor aye. 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 opposed pending business and updates we are going to change the order of our agenda momentarily we're going to go down to item 12 ordinances the 2020-01 amendment of chapter 11.05 door county code all-terrain vehicles and utility terrain vehicle routes I will ask John to start us off I move for approval ordinance 2020-01 I'll second, second that mr. chairman uh, what what this ordinance is doing is approving the yellow I mean pardon me the blue lines that you see on this piece of paper so that Bailey's Harbor can connect our county roads with their town roads that's pretty upfront and pretty understandable it's on page 82 for anybody who needs it back now there's some confusion coming in as to whether the road across Croswick is a, uh, a part of our trail there was a vote taken, and I believe it was 2019-07, where supposedly the vote said it's not part of our trail, but I've been told it is part of our trail. So maybe somebody makes more money than I do can explain this to me. <laughs> and if, and if, I don't have a dog in this fight, but if somebody wanted that road to be removed, a crosswalk across that lake, they could amend this resolution stating that. So that, I think, is our course of action here, and it's, it's up to you, start to the bay or what you just want to do or anybody. But that, that's where we're at. We, we, need a, we need to get this out in the open and get this settled. Benny. I just have a question on the map. Are the red lines, uh, there's not like a key for them, so are those already approved sites? And so yes. the one you're asking about is just the causeway, so does that mean on either side of the causeway they are already approved, but just not the causeway? So you'd ride up yeah. to the causeway and back, or the other side up to it and back? I mean, I, I just don't understand it. Sure, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me clarify. Okay. So if you look at that map, the portions in red are already approved and are official trails okay. that are active right now. Yep. What's the resolution before you today is just for those two blue portions that are on the map being shown. I think what John <coughs> has brought up is that at one point in time at the highway committee and at county board we had discussed the crossing at the causeway okay. and the committee at that time had thought they had recommended not approving that. But it actually was already approved in 2018, so that's why we included the information in the packet. So in 2018, the red portions were approved. In 2019, we brought forth a different section, and that was denied. But then now it's it's come back, and it's come back for those blue areas. So in essence, what you're looking at today is just the approval of the blue areas, which we would recommend endorsing. And then really the question would be is that if you want the highway committee to discuss the causeway crossing, then that's something that you should make a recommendation to the highway committee to consider or you can make an amendment, but I guess I'd recommend sending it back to the highway committee for discussion after speaking with Grant on that. 
Yeah, I, I would concur. And by way of further explanation, on page 83 of the agenda packet is a mandatory ordinance 2018-12. Item 8 is what, and this ordinance was enacted, uh, but item 8 uh, is the uh, part that uh, covers the uh, road uh, or the causeway. And that was actually enacted. There was some misunderstanding in 2019 when 2019-07 was brought forward. That's on page 84 of your packet, and I believe that's why uh, that ordinance was uh, not enacted but uh, defeated. But but so we don't cause further con confusion if the will of this of the county board is to not have the snowmobile or the uh, ATV UTV route go across the causeway to send it back to the highway committee to rewrite uh, number uh, which which is number eight. Excuse me, which is number nine on on the present ordinance. On the present ordinance, correct. Okay, so let me clarify my confusion. <laughs> so on today's amendatory ordinance, 2020-01, is the causeway included or not included? It is included. It is included. Correct. Not in number 10. Not in number 10. No. It's in number nine. number 9. Number 9. Okay, so, all right, so if we approve the amendatory ordinance as presented to us currently, mm -hmm. the causeway would stay as part of the trail and continue to be used. Correct. So if we don't want it to continue to be used, that's what you're recommending that we send back to highway. With directions to revise number nine to eliminate the causeway and return it to the county board for action. So bottom line, if we approve it as it is written today, causeway stays in. Okay. Joel. I'm going to make the comment that I made at Highway and going back to when this started a year or two ago with 18 to 19, the intent and conversation that happened at the Highway, as I recall, and at County Board, was to not include the causeway. It's in there. Somehow, shape, or form, it got adversely put in there. My comment I made at Highway was, it's been in there. None of us knew about it. There's been no problems going on. They still want to keep it. So my opinion is, and I made the, that decision out there, is why would we take it back if it's working? Let's just leave it and move on and add what they want in the blue and be done and continue and keep part of it there. The town of uh, Bailey's Harbor has said that they would like to keep it part of there. So no harm, no foul, I guess, in my opinion at this point. And I'm in favor of UTV trails, so I'm going to keep fighting to keep it open. It would be my take on it. Susan. Um, just a clarification. At the top of page 83, it says... This is the this is the one that passed apparently with the causeway in. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's May 22nd. It says on the top. The next one, page 84. This is the one that didn't pass for the reasons Joel pretty much explained, and that's dated July 23rd. So it seems like we decided not to have the causeway after the one where the causeway was approved. No, so I, I guess don't understand me, how. Yep, I can understand where the confusion is. And what it is is really, and you can't see it on page 84 because of the color, but it's a little bit grayer, and actually it's in red. So what we do when we bring forward the ordinance, so for example, if you go back, again, this to page 81, anything that I guess that's added in terms of something that's new in terms of trails, we always present it in red. So what happened in 2019, if you go to that back to your, that one that you're talking about on page 84, Number eight, which was the causeway crossing, was in black and is actually already part of the trail system. It's what was light. denied was actually item number nine, which is not the causeway. <coughs> so that's what the difference is and what you're oh. seeing. So what we're trying to do is that each time it comes forward, we're showing you what is additional trails that are being added on to the overall system. It's always shown in red at the bottom. So again, in 2018, it was approved, which was represented as item eight. In 2019, you can see item 8 is now black, and then item 9 was actually presented in red, and that was voted down. If you go to our existing resolution that's before you today, you'll see that items 1 through 9 are in black. <coughs> in other words, they are already approved and active trails. And now item 10 is the item that you are considering today, which would be the items that are represented in blue on the map. Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with uh, Mr. Gunlickson 100%. They've had it, 
it's working. There's no problems. I voted against it in 2019, but no, it, it, it's fine. Uh, I have absolutely no problem, and, and the town of Billy's Harbor wants this. Let them have it. I, it, it's not, it hasn't been a problem. I don't see that it will be. So, Dave. Um, part of this is my own fault because I didn't bother to read in our last discussion. I did not read all of the previous items because I made the presumption that this was an addition. At that time, though, you are correct. The causeway is included in number eight. Had I read that, because I was not here for that resolution, I was absent that day. At that time, my whole discussion at this during this meeting, I would have been opposed to it then as well. Unfortunately, the reality is, is I'm confused as to why number nine actually sits on top of part of the previously approved section of eight when we denied it. Because it does start from the Red Cherry Road going westerly to the town road, to the town property, which is essentially what this next resolution does. This next resolution is what should have been presented when I was here last. Because we already included that portion of County E that goes over the causeway. Now, I'm personally, I run into issues with ATVs on the road quite routinely. Um, I'm not in favor of this continuation of, of um, vehicles on the road that tend to cause problems for everything else that's also on the road. Okay. Vinny. Um, I thank you for explaining the map, but I, I still can't tell <coughs> what is the entire ATV trail that leads. One of the goals was to go, I think, from Bailey's Harbor to Egg Harbor. Is there there's the connection point or the main point of that, the extension on County E across Highway A? And I remember there being discussion about just concern about ATVs crossing Highway A, um, which, I, you know, I'm not saying I have the right answer to that either way, but just to see, like, a little more connectivity of <clears throat> this is proposed to connect to another town set of trails. Or on this, it looks like if I was on an ATV, I could only go from Red Cherry Road to the border of the town of Egg Harbor on E. But then I couldn't go into, I can't take North Maple Road or Red Cherry Road. Are those part of it? And I can't see it on the map? Uh, yeah. The county only controls county roads. The town can control what they want. Yeah. So they can add anything to this. The, the blue lines you see can be connected by the town because they're town roads. But I guess to make a decision, it'd be nice to know which ones are allowed to have ATVs on them already by the town or the county. That's a town, that's a town decision. But I mean, is there a current map yeah. of where they are? We get it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the town officials are here. Could you yeah. come up to the mic and just explain which roads are open? Please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dick Rocky. <clears throat> I have uh, the ordinance in front of me that was that was passed. Excuse me. I can give you a list. You're looking for the town roads. Correct. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Roughly 30 town roads, basically all of Bailey's Harbor is open to ATV traffic. Uh, I guess there's, there was some confusion, as you uh, has been well mentioned here. Um, uh, excuse me, I've got kind of a nasty cold, so if I get a little gaggy, excuse me. But, uh, we're, we're, I guess what we're trying to figure out now is if the causeway is open, or isn't open. What we're asking for is an extension from County from County Highway A, uh, County Highway E West to the uh, town line of Egg Harbor, <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me to connect Red Cherry, which is by the cemetery out of Bailey's Harbor on County Highway Double E, connect that with North Maple. What that will do is make a complete circle, and at that time. I will be presenting this again if we get this passed. Then I'll be presenting this in front of the board of Gibraltar, trying to get South Highland from F, which is open, and I'll go right to County Highway A, and then the two there's two one mile stretches that would connect into Double E. That would take all of Bailey's and connect it all with the rest of Bailey's, due to the fact it's stretched out for that long area. And that's why we're requesting. That one mile stretch of double E and then the extension onto uh, E from 
A to the Egg Harbor Tower Line. That's, that's basically what we're asking for. Not a lot of distance, it's just would make it very convenient for us to tie all this stuff together with other communities. So uh, I guess uh, rather than go through all the little town roads in here, basically all of Bailey's town roads are open for ATV and UTV traffic. Does anybody have any questions of me that maybe I can? Alexis. Um, so you said that there's confusion about the causeway within the town. So even though it's been approved, has it been used by ATVs and UTVs? Yes. It has been. Yes, the so signs are all up. Yeah. And we were okay. under the assumption that we could use the go across the causeway. Okay. And then all of a sudden, we, when we asked for the, the extension, somehow it got screwed up a little bit. And then that got, the, we heard it got denied. But, the, but apparently it didn't. But that was hearsay, and I know better than listening to hearsay anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Bob Schultz. I'm a supervisor for the town of Bailey's Harbor. Good morning. And I would ask what Denny, the comment you made, the reason we want, we wanted to extend E is on A it's a four-way stop, a lot safer. Double E is only a, that's a bad area. We stayed away from it. Yeah. But this, yeah. Joel Swanson back here, he, I thought he did a really good job of, we stayed out of territories we shouldn't be in. And, uh, Thank That's you. I just I to helped say. to see the big picture. of I didn't know all the town roads were open, so I see the connectivity because I can see the whole picture. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll go to the voter board. It's an ordinance. Maybe we'll go to the <laughs> Solidly on it. <laughs> that has passed on the vote of 18 yes and 3 no. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back up to the top of the order. Resolution 2020-07, approval of gift grant and or donation to the York County EM and <coughs> Communications Department. Joel? Yep, give me two seconds to get back up there. Page 11. Yep. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. A second. Uh, what for is uh, getting grant money to provide training for CPR? Any questions? If not, we'll go to the voter board. first. Resolution 2020-08, approval of gift, grant, and or donation to the Sheriff's Department. Joel. I would also make a motion to approve this resolution 2020-08. I'll second that. Um, money from uh, Sartre Marine uh, for $4,500 to purchase a drone. Questions? We'll go to the voter board. Resolution 08. That's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Come on. That's the 
Dave. Rock to you, Dave. You got a head. Thank you. you See, I said no to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't beat that your remote. 21, yes or no. Resolution 2020-09, approval of gift, grant, and or donation of the Highway Department clean sweep contract. Mr. Ninus. I make a motion to approve res resolution 2020-09. I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. This is this is a, a grant that we can receive to run our clean sweep program. Anybody got a question on clean sweep, I can explain it. I'm sure we all know what it is. Any questions? We'll go to the voter board. Pass on a vote of 21 yes, zero no. Resolution 2020-10, petition to the Secretary of Transportation for airport improvement aid by Door County Cherryland Airport. John. I make a motion to approve this resolution we have before us. Second. Uh, I'm going to refer to our county administrator in explanation of this one. Sure, so this one's... Uh, actually a process we need to go through uh, since it's at the airport, but in essence what we're trying to do is upgrade our payment process at the airport. Again, the, the current method does not allow for um, credit cards. Of the, your, a lot of the cards have chips now and everything. They have not upgraded the technology there in a while, and we have to go through the process uh, at the federal level and following the DOT standards to go through that process and have them sponsor that project moving forward. So that's why it's before you here today. David. Uh, we don't take credit cards now there? They do take credit cards, but they do not accept the, um, they don't chip have the, type, the chip, chip type. Correct. Okay, so we don't need an infrastructure update of some sort of uh, IT <coughs> activity. Correct. TS. Correct. That stuff is already there in place. That is correct. And as I understand it, the fuel pumps have to be converted by October? Correct. Since October is a requirement to have the chips in all, in all fuel pumps. So it's a mandate anyway. <coughs> yeah. So we're just asking for money, right? So that can be a voice vote. All in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Door County's animal policy. Dan. I'll make a motion to pass resolution 202010. Uh, excuse me, 202811. I'll defer to Grant to explain it. Is there a second? I'll second, second that. Is that yeah. Very briefly, unless somebody has questions, uh, our existing policy predates me, so it's old. Uh, and what the ex policy that's before you does is simply memorialize what we have been doing and what we're required to do under the Americans with Disability Acts, and that's distinguished between service animals and uh, all the rest. So, in essence, a policy is a general exclusion where animals are prohibited in county buildings, facilities, and vehicles, and chief among the exceptions to the general prohibitions are service animals, which we have to allow pursuant to the ADA, which in fact we have been allowing. And we've also got provisions in there, although they're not automatic, for the comfort, companion, emotional support, and animals as well, but those have to be approved in advance if we're going to allow them into the buildings. Questions? Dave. Just a simple question reading through on page uh, 25, subsection D3, pets. <coughs> um, many people bring, you know, there's a private carrier that runs uh, private flights back and forth out of the airport. The way this is written, and maybe I just missed it, I don't see that technically we allow pets for people that are going on the charter flight or coming off a charter flight. I read this as meaning that the private hangars are allowed to have their pets within their private hangars. Yeah, that's the exception for the uh, the airport hangars, and uh, I don't there I don't see an issue with the uh, animals coming off the flights and going across the airport you know, property and into their cars. Yeah, and neither do I. Just that we went we we substantially updated this, and mm -hmm. it's not mentioned as a category. That's all. So. Megan. Thanks. Um, grant question for you. Um, I'm looking at uh, sec sections H and I. 
um, and wondering what the process would be for expressed authorized approval of a therapy animal or an emotional support animal. Um, when we're talking about folks with mental health issues, sometimes these do come into play. Mm -hmm. And um, I would hope that that would be, that process would be laid out. Well, the uh, questions or queries about those would be directed to the facilities and parks director. And if he had any issues, uh, if they had any issues, they would uh, be able to contact either Karen or myself uh, what we are trying to do, again, is permit what we're obligated to allow with the service animals under the ADA and create a means by which uh, some of the other uh, categories of animals can be allowed. Uh, and again, it's on a permission in advance. They just have to let the uh, facilities and uh, parks director know and uh, evaluate whether or not it was appropriate. If they had any questions, you could bring it to Karen and my attention okay but so as, is, as you might know there's been a lot of abuse with exactly yeah I know it therapy and emotionally Very because much so. they're not, not regulated and mm -hmm. right. somebody has a you know a pet yeah uh, it's kind of one of those situations where one or two can ruin it for yeah mm -hmm. for the whole yeah so that's why I was curious about that about what the uh, what that process would be so it would just be <coughs> dependent on contacting whoever that individual in charge is. Correct. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, case -case. and once they received approval one time, they wouldn't have to come back to the well again. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Vinny. I have one. Um, Grant, how would this impact something like the, the like therapy or service dog that does programs at the library for kids? Is something like that or like the bird sanctuary that might bring in birds for a bird program? Are things like that allowed still with this or not? Uh, they would have to get permission on a case-by-case -case basis. So they could get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry. <coughs> not my voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> You're getting lucky. You're getting lucky. <laughs> You have to ask permission. Oh, mm -hmm. Approval of the agreement for dark fiber and conduit with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. David. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2020 12. Second. Uh, Jason is supposed to be here to answer any questions. <coughs> All right, he is. Um, I think I'll just leave it to Jason. The memo explains it Good morning. Pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, essentially, we get to the, the biggest pain point to the project or the collapse point of all of our fiber uh, throughout the city that we recently put in um, is the crossing of the canal. Um, and that's because it has to follow a conduit path underneath the, the water. Um, uh, essentially, we, uh, we're going to do it with Sturgeon Bay Utilities. Uh, the DOT approached us with interest in um, partnering where we would provide them some bandwidth and get uh, them connectivity um, back to their equipment and in return we would get to cross that canal uh, with no fee so it's a to me it's a no-brainer it's a, uh, an easy way for us to save roughly nineteen thousand dollars a year in those crossing costs but and also um, strengthen our partnership with them because there's multiple other projects that we do with them on a yearly basis Questions? Thank you. We'll go to the voter board. <laughs> Trying. Not good. I moved back to you. Right. Again. I have to be careful what I say. It's one of those rotating viruses. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use that word. Let's <coughs> pass the vote of 21, yes. Resolution 2020-13, change of user fees for emergency medical ambulance services. Joel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion to approve resolution 2020-13, please. I'll second that. 
I think the what for on it is pretty self explanatory under the fee structure sheet and the only thing that is being changed at this point is actually a reduction to ALS call of service charges. And, and, and an increase in the mileage rate. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Any questions? What's this? Um, and the spreadsheet on 48, um, the green columns were listed as resident versus non-resident, but in the fee schedule, it said Door County was not. Did I just read that wrong? They didn't, that Door County did not differentiate resident versus non-resident, it's not recommended? Correct, we, Correct. Have, we have not made a difference between resident and non-resident this time. Okay. So is Door County Emergency Services different than than this, than what we're, are we Door County Emergency Services? Yes. So I think what they did is that, yeah, it was one of those things that they were discussing and I just think they forgot to update the final recommendation that it would, that would not be green. Okay, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? If not, we'll go to the voter board. Only has the power to be. <laughs> okay, what do I do? Oh, they got it. <laughs> Confirm. <laughs> Maybe a magic hey, marker over there. there. <laughs> That's fast. Vote 21, yes, zero, no. <coughs> Resolution 2020 14, Intergovernmental Agreement, City of Sturgeon Bay, Sturgeon Bay Door County Economic Development Loan Program. Could I have a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, to adopt resolution number 2020-14. I'll second that. Sure. So I, Grant can backfill me on this, but in essence, if we recall, we actually did pass a initial resolution in concept, and this now comes back to where we have, I guess, two things, or I guess the intergovernmental agreement with the city actually enclosed in the agreement. Uh, again, if you go through, I guess, this to general terms, it's talking again about the closeout of our existing revolving loan fund, which are considered federal dollars. Once we close that program, those dollars would be returned to the state. And under this agreement, we are allowing the opportunity for the city of Surgeon Bay to then apply for those funds for the West Side School Project. As part of the, as uh, allowing that to continue, uh, what as part of the agreement we're doing is we're setting up a, a loan fund program that would be considered countywide, and that would be initially funded through the city's $875,000, which is considered non, I guess, federalized money, or it's called defederalized funds. Um, with this uh, agreement, it then outlines in terms of at the 15-year term, this is when the term expire, uh, really expires, but it's when the project is then available to, in essence, be marketed by the developer. And at that time, they would um, be able to return some of the expenses related to the project back to the city for the relocation of the park. And as part of that, they would then match um, an additional 875 into the loan fund. So both of us would be fully vested at equal amounts. And also with that, there would be an additional $400,000 that would be available that we could apply towards a housing program. I don't know if there's grants or there's anything else like to add to that. Well, we also included uh, just as a reference on your table is again, we had this as a draft before, but we also have the <coughs> loan fund policy manual that's in there. And the way the committee is set up in the resolution states it is that we have uh, individuals appointed to uh, mostly by the DC EDC board, but then also the city and the county also has a rep. The only thing I'll point out is, uh, and it's in the intergovernmental agreement, we've done this in stages. Uh, resolution number 2019-86 that was adopted on December 17, 2019 authorized a closeout of the uh, revolving loan fund and creation of the Sturgeon Bay Door County Economic Development Loan Program, which the present resolution does. Uh, on paragraph 4 on page 50, there's a typo, there are two 2019s. Uh, the only decision today and 
Dave Lienau brought this up at the administrative committee meeting is on paragraph 8B. Any funds remaining will be distributed equally between the county and the city, which was the initial language, and David had brought up whether we want to do it on a pro rata basis, so I've included between the county and city on a pro rata basis, which is a proportionate, uh, proportional allocation based on their contribution to the loan program. I think we had initially put in a share equally because the way we're contributing funds to the loan program is kind of unique. In 15 years from now, perhaps no one will be around to explain it, but as David pointed out, we may also be putting additional funds into the loan program during that 15 year period. So there's some uh, benefit to having on a pro rata basis. I, I don't know that I have a dog in the fight, but. Anybody? Linda. So. Um, on um, the bottom of page 50, uh, paragraph nine, it said the city, Oh, I also had a question on how you determine interest rate, but I see that's explained in the handout that we received this morning as I page through there quickly. Anyway, on the bottom of page 50, paragraph 9, it says the city will have non-competitive access to the county's $1.4 million. So we're more or less saying that is the city's, nothing else is going to be going to come before that, and it uses an example of the West Side School Housing Project. So not necessarily dedicated to the West Side School project, right? It could be other projects within the city. Correct. They need to actually get the award from WIDA for the project to move forward. Okay. <clears throat> so if the project's not awarded, then we need to, I guess, retool what we consider the qualifying project. But not necessarily a housing project. Correct. Thank you. Susan. So... I got confused, <laughs> as Grant explained. So is it, are we voting to do the equal distribution or the pro rata? That's, a deci that's a, the decision that's left to the county board. I put it forward as an option and we will line up the one that doesn't apply. Okay, so if we pass the resolution, then we still have to decide? Or the resolution we is? Would, we would decide before we pass the resolution. Okay, okay. So, so to that question, are we are we being asked today, since we're voting on the resolution, are we being asked today yes. to vote on, make a, somebody make a motion on one or the other? Correct. We're asking okay. for an and amendment I, to strike out one of the two. So at this moment, I'd make a, an amendment to uh, remove the equally between the county and the city and replace it with the between the county and the city on a pro rata, pro rata basis. I'll second I'll that. Second that. Um, because of, as you mentioned, that was one of my concerns and one of the reasons I highlighted this, because back up in eight and number six, I constantly question this, which is the city will provide an equal, an additional eight hundred thousand five seven hundred eight hundred and seventy five thousand, but there's no guarantee that they're going to do that. No guarantee that they need to do that at the end of the fifteen year period. Correct. I mean, there's there's that possibility, which would make it that which makes this choice of words fit me better. Which is yes. because if they Which don't do it, what triggered me to bring it up, right? Mm -hmm. or, or if we each right. decide to put in five hundred thousand and a million, same issue arises. Right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so the, the end result should be that the monies get divided based on the monies you put in. Correct. And would our monies, the one point four mil, be considered part of that ratio? Whatever money was contributed. Right. Well, and, and no, not. Not, not, uh, that's no. not going to go directly into the revolving loan fund, but... The, well, the new money being put in by each side. Right. Right, right. this 1.4 is due to other issues involved federally and state. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're turning over for their purposes because that's the way it works best for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and, and much to the, uh, <coughs> Supervisor Waite's question, the non-competitive access to is... That's basically if the West Side project does not occur, which is what's been presented during this entire pro discussion, um, how does a different project come back? Does it come back to the committee that's being developed? Does it come back to the individual aldermen and county board? How does that change occur? I guess if they have a qualifying project right. and they apply to weed and it's approved, it wouldn't need any additional approval from this, this from body. this body. Yeah, because right. sort of the reality is, 
if it doesn't occur within the time frame and that was when does that expire now Ken? year and a half year and a half that money then gets flushed into the federal system and nobody has access you know we wouldn't have access to it so and then my last question is what does what constitutes the materially breaches we decide that on a case-by-case -case basis but that's fairly common language in a contract and uh, you know materiality has been defined by common law and it's it's something of great significance uh, you know a, a, a trivial or a nominal breach isn't going to trigger that it has to be something that undermines <coughs> the purpose and intent of the contract thank you Vinny. I might just need a refresher on this but on the handout we got today in paper on page 6, 3.4, uh, number 3, and it has an ineligible activities, residential building construction or reconstruction. So I'm trying to understand that, going back to what Linda was commenting on, number 9 on page 50 of our computer packet. Um, I just, can you explain again how something is a residential project versus uh, reconstructed as a business project and where the housing project in Sturgeon Bay fits within those? Thank you. <laughs> sure. So you got to consider the, what we're, what we're using the federal money for is actually for a housing related project. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's being used for that because it's a qualifying project in terms of what's identified in terms of income levels for individuals that are going to be living in those residencies. What we're using then with the city money, which is, again, considered defederalized and it doesn't have any rules attached to it, they're setting up a loan program because ours is going away that's specifically targeted towards economic development related activities. And that does not include housing per se. So that's why you'll see the difference in terms of, on our agreement, the money, that 1.4 is going towards a qualifying project <coughs> for housing stuff, but yep. the new fund is actually set up outside of that, specifically for yeah. economic development related activities. Thank you, I just need a refresher. Yep, that's perfect. <laughs> Helen. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> now have you talked to the city about the option of the pro rata versus equal? Yes. You have? Okay. Yes. It's, I just had not heard of it, so I was just following up on that. <laughs> and they're okay with it, so if I vote yes, I won't be <laughs> getting in trouble. <laughs> Oh. Also, can you explain the difference between reconstruction and remodeling as you see in the city's application process? Like reconstruction says it's eligible, but I'm not sure if that means remodeling of an existing business. Is this only net new construction or is it changing one business from another or is it one business physically expanding or could it be internally remodeling? Sorry, it's just like a detailed question, but I'm curious. As far as eligible projects? Yes. Those will be, um, and some of those, traditionally what they're done is they're, we usually try to tie that into either an expansion of the business or mm -hmm. an area where they're, again, they're going to provide more, I guess, business growth mm -hmm. or okay. provide additional employment. Okay. So that changes okay. a little bit in terms of, now it's not directly tied to job creation, but that's, I guess, one of the criteria is that they try to use that in terms of the value of the project in terms of the loan and what the risk factor is for that. Which could somewhat be if they needed to change part of their business plan to incorporate something new. That is okay. correct. Thank you. Linda. Um, I believe the loan itself is for, can be for either private or public investment, correct? So could the city use these funds for their own devices, say for the waterfront development walkway and things like that? It has to be a private individual? Yep, these are for businesses, economic development businesses, correct. Okay. Vinny? Okay. Right. Uh, one more, sorry. <laughs> I think this is the time to ask. So under ineligible businesses on the sheet that we got today, two, number six, other businesses not serving the interests of the community. I'm just trying to visualize how a committee would determine if a business serves the interests of the community or not, since that's so objective. Um, actually, Grant, I'll defer to Grant. And that one, I know before we actually changed some of the wording because in the original uh, documents for like the federal loans, I think they were for dance clubs. Those, those would and be those, the examples, but you, okay. you can't single those out, and it okay. is subjective. So the committee would have a chance to have a say in that based on keeping this in here? Correct. And all Perfect. we have to yeah. be is be consistent yeah. in what we determine to be 
or not we, but what the committee determines to be not serving the interest of the community. Thank you. Ellen, did you? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, to kind of bring it out a little bit, um, a lot of these loans are given to people who are entrepreneurs who are working already with um, economic development. They have a class right, right now that they're running uh, that's actually run th is held at economic development at the location, but it's actually um, being taught by people from UWGB. People um, learn about what it is to run a business. Some people come in with no business plan. Some people come in with, you know, a pretty fully flushed out <coughs> business plan. Um, so a lot of these people, um, so people go to the bank, they apply for money, maybe they, they get part of what they need, but they don't have the rest. They can then apply to the loan, uh, revolving loan fund for some money. And some of the current examples would be um, Healthy Way. Um, they received a loan for $250,000 specifically for equipment. And um, Wild Tomato in Egg Harbor also applied for a loan for equipment. And that's the type of thing that these loans are going to. So if it, it's a, a, a program that hasn't been well used, but I think that one of the things we've done in the last couple of years is try to promote the use of this, of this money because basically it's kind of been sitting there. So there is X amount of money out there to, um, to loan out currently. And I think the, the goal in the future is to have a large enough pot of money that we can really try to stimulate um, business ventures, especially for people who maybe don't come in with deep pockets and need a little help. But it's one of the things that we're looking at is not just the money, but having a really good sound business plan to go with it. So um, writing a good business plan is complicated and we would really like to encourage people to go ahead and either expand their businesses or, and I know um, Healthy Way, I, part of his business plan was hiring eight more people. So it's, that's the type of, that's kind of what it looks like on the ground, I guess. Anybody else? <coughs> okay, so Grant, keep me straight. So now we have, first we have to vote on the amendment to the resolution. Cur amendment to the intergovernmental agreement. I'm sorry, amendment to the intergovernmental agreement. You did, okay. And I think that motion has been made and seconded. Yes. yes. Okay. yes. yes. Right. Yeah. So we're going to do a voice vote <coughs> on the amendment to the intergovernmental agreement. So all in favor of the amendment. May, may remind us that the intent of the uh, amendment. Amendment. Let's repeat the Give amendment. Pro the, the pro rata. Mm -hmm. And to remove the one and keep the pro rata choice. Mm -hmm. right. okay. So all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. So we've now approved the amendment to the pro rata on the intergovernmental agreement. So now we'll go to the, unless there's other questions, Susan. Well, it's not really a question. I just, I want to compliment the staff on this, Ken and whoever else worked, Grant mm -hmm. and others. Um, I hated to see the revolving loan program that we had go by the wayside or, and the concern that all that money would be taken out of the community and, as Grant said, flushed back into the federal system. So I really appreciate them staying on top of it, figuring out a way to not only use it, but use it for a goal we have, which is more housing, and then to set up, essentially, a replacement for the revolving loan. I think that's a, a really good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Good job. So we will go to the voter board. Maybe. <laughs> In what? It's her effort to get your software. Let's see what happens. <laughs> You're behind again, Bob. It's officially dead. We yeah. see if it works if it's closer. Vote first. Just trade battery. Right, and wait until it turns yellow. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's past.
So, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna, yeah, we can get better. better. Yeah. Linda has Linda, Linda. Okay, resolution 2020-15, intergovernmental agreement, town of Sebastopol, Muskrat property. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion we adopt resolution number 2020-15. Second. Thank you. Discussion? I'm sorry, but I still think it sets a precedence. That's the only thing I worry about. Is your microphone on? Oh, okay. I, no, it's on. Might be on. I there just. There we go. <laughs> Would you say that again? <laughs> I'm just worried about a precedence, and if we could start one. And that was a topic of conversation at the admin meeting. I know finance also had a mm -hmm. pretty good discussion. It was a tied three-three vote in finance. Yes, as I understand. David, did you? Yeah, that's what I was going to indicate. It, it first came to finance, uh, I think, uh, a month ago before it went, or two months ago before it went to the admin. There didn't seem to be any sort of consensus to support this at finance, but then after uh, you developed the contract through the admin committee, it came back last week, and it was a 3-3 tie with one person absent to not support the funding for it. As Nancy indicated, it's uh, the idea of a precedent. It seems... Uh, now, in my mind as well, it's uh, the $60,000 bill, which Grant indicated we might get back, most likely we would, but it, it's still a bill that's being sent to a property owner that's uh, almost, in essence, in my mind, a taking because it's you're requiring them to pay that amount to, to retain the, you know, or come up with that money somehow. And uh, given a while longer, that property ownership may change and some of this resolve on its own without these efforts. We do sympathize with what Sebastopol is trying to do, but it's, it's not the precedent we thought we should go down to. Dave? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I think it's the county itself does not have the authority to do this action. Supporting another municipality to do the action is a different story altogether. But um, since 2005, apparently, we had a raise at, uh, order at that time. Um, at that time included every building including the barn for some reason now we're doing a raise order on every building except the barn according to the uh, chair of Sebastopol part of that was due to the fact of that artist interest in the barn but the rest of the buildings will end up in paintings as well um, these there are argument can be easily made that we are effectively forcing the hands of landowner um, they happen to be in a spot that is viewed as um, the beginning of the byways. It's actually a little beyond the beginning of the byways. Uh, there are plenty of places in the county, in the state, in the country that by this definition should be torn down right now. And I don't agree with forcing that issue on a homeowner. That's their business. They're paying their taxes. They're paying their insurance. Um, there is a not overly friendly looking operation right next door to a lot of people. I don't have a problem with it, but part of that is being shaded right now by these buildings that are in place. Um, do we move on to the next set of buildings? It has hundreds of acres of, of basically abandoned vehicles. It happens to be a legally operating business, but where do you stop? If the municipality wants to do it, they have the authority to go through that through their ordinances, as they have done in the past. Um, the other thing is, if we did this originally back in 2005, that means they've had 15 years to assemble monies in order to do this on their own. Um, they've assembled 25,000 for whatever reason. They, they state that they'll have the remaining 30, the half fee that they're asking for. But this is not an unusual request by a number of municipalities throughout the state. I operate in several of them that operate very similar functions like this. I have difficulty pushing the hands of somebody that owns land that for whatever reason has chosen not to sell it, has chosen not to maintain the buildings to somebody's definition of a standard, and we're going to make them tear them down. We start to do this on a routine basis, it's not the right way to go. Now a side note, on the, on the agenda, on the intergovernmental agreement, line two, uh, this agreement shall take to begin effective the first day of February 2020. Haven't we passed that date? <coughs> we, we can make the agreement effective whatever day, and since they started the raise order, it makes sense for us to coordinate it with that. 
that's the date that it's tied to? That's what I was trying to do, yes. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I can't help but have to point out the irony of the, the location of the property. Um, Mr. Anigal alluded to it a little bit that, you know, this is kind of the facade that hides a much bigger problem. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of abandoned cars. Again, it's a legally operating uh, business, but the bigger problem is the groundwater contamination from all of those automobiles. The decades of cars with all of the automotive fluids, uh, and that's part of the ground, you know, uh, groundwater, uh, the zone of contribution for the city. Um, again, I, I, I struggle with, with the precedent, you know, and I, I almost feel like we should be looking at the bigger issues, which is really the underlying more serious issues than just what someone might consider an ugly building. Um, I don't know. I, again, I, I think I, it, it is, it is a, this is a tough one for me. Um, the precedent that it, it sets, as um, Mr. Robillard alluded to, I, 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 I agree it does. It's a slippery slope. And again, I think we should be, if we're going to be looking at these kind of things, we should be looking at the underlying real issues that affect the community in a real way, not just what something looks like. Thank you. Laura. Great, thank you. I was uh, unfortunately unable to attend the finance committee, um, and I would not have voted to pass this forward. Um, but considering that, I, I do sympathize. I do think intergovernmental agreements are important to um, to collaborate and work together. With this being said, just some of the facts that have already been stated just right before me, you know, starting since 2005, already so many years into this, but also listening to the comments today. Um, that this can get done without us, it's just going to take them longer to do that. Um, I don't want to assume that a new heir or the current heir is not planning to sell this. Um, I think not having appraisal on it to make a decision does not help for me to make it make that choice for the county's tax dollars to be involved in this. The va land value on the documents we've received is a third of what projecting for the project, and that's just a projection. So. As of way it stands, I, I can't support this as is, but if there's another way that we could lend them the money to keep, to, to allot it to this project, and they pay us back in three years, but not as this agreement as it stands. Thank you. Susan. Um, all right, I'm going to change the opinion here, <laughs> at least <laughs> my opinion. Um, I don't have a problem with the precedent or the slippery slope. I think that it's our job to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis based on their merits. And I think um, we are not going to be faced with this all the time. Um, in this case, the town of Sevastopol has done its due diligence. I appreciate this. I think this is a different circumstance because it is a main artery of our county. Um, and it is an important artery of our county that everybody sees. Um, as a matter of fact, correct me if I'm wrong, Grant, but the people have not paid their taxes for the last two years. Um, they are relatively current. Well, relatively current, but nonetheless not current. Um, and maybe you can clarify, <coughs> first, it's not 60000 it's 30000 and we would retrieve it if and when the property were sold. Am I right about that? We're not asking the property owner to pay us for doing this. So I would vote for this. The way it would work, and there's absolutely no guarantee, it's all tied into what the purchase price of the property would be, is that the town would place the expenses incurred against the real estate as a special assessment. It would then be collected as would a property tax. If it were delinquent for two or more years, and wasn't paid, then the county would include it in its in-rem foreclosures, and then through the post-foreclosure sale of the property, hopefully recruit, recoup its uh, out-of-pocket expenses. But the sale price would be, have to be uh, great enough to cover those. So, and, and that's anybody's guess as what it might be, but that's the process. Okay, Megan? Um, and also throughout that process, please correct me if I'm wrong, if this property were to be sold, um, they, we would, we would be recouping that regardless if it was sold or if it would title, the title would transfer to the next heir. Is that correct? 
once the expenses are, once the costs are included as a special assessment, they're a lien that runs with the property. So yes, if, if it were sold, we could uh, recoup. Again, if the sale price was high enough. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I feel like the sale price would be a lot higher without the buildings on it as well. If they sold it, we get If they sold it, yeah, we get the money out of it, assuming the sale price was high enough. Ken. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with uh, both Megan and Susie. Uh, it's getting scary how often I'm agreeing with Susie <laughs> <laughs> lately. Uh, but anyway, we discussed it at, uh, at admin. It's not precedent setting. It, it, we are very much within our bounds to take it case by case, and that's what this is. And the county, Dave, goes out and helps the towns all the time. We put money in to aid the towns and, and to say that's wrong to do in this case, that's not right. Also, orders to raise, those go on every day and you certainly know that in your line of business. So that, again, is within the right of the town to do and, and that's just the way it is. And as far as Bob's comment, uh, <coughs> to uh, branch out to another, we're, we're dealing with one, uh, one item right here to take it on to something further and further and further down the line that has nothing to do with this, it, that's wrong thinking on our part. This is, this is here, and it's a resolution on this one item, and that's what we have to make our decision on. Is this the right thing to do? And we've wanted <coughs> this cleaned up for years and years and years, and yes, it's $30,000 well spent as far as I'm concerned, and I'm definitely in favor of it. Biz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Susan and I agree with Ken on this. I don't think it sets a precedent because any town board that think they have a mess like this on a corridor for Door County can, can bring it uh, to the county board case by case basis. But it looks to me uh, on, on looking at the stuff in our packet that, that these people own three parcels. So we're only talking about the 34.50 acres uh, on page 56, that's that's the property that we would tie up with this, uh, with our our 30 and and uh, Sevastopol's 30,000. Just on that property, not the other two. Correct. That's where the uh, remedial action would be focused on the one parcel, and then we could Im uh, impose the cost that were incurred as a special assessment against that parcel. Damn. Well, first thing is um, <laughs> there's no safety or health hazard here, so to use as an excuse, we did something in Carswell, and that was a safety hazard. It definitely is precedent setting, and where it becomes precedent setting is that five, ten years from now, when most of us aren't going to be on the board, look back and say, well, the board did that years ago, we can do it again, and that's where the precedent setting starts in. And um, even one, of them, Kenny even said at the admin committee, well, maybe the city will come after us to get money to tear the greenery down. <laughs> <laughs> Let us hope. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it becomes precedent setting. And um, other towns will start coming to us to ask money to help them tear this down, tear that down. And that's it. Helen? Well, I would just like to say that of all the comments I hear from people, <laughs> The number of comments about this piece of property, you know, are, are just like, why don't you do something about that? I mean, that is kind of the number one complaint that I hear from people. And also, if we are setting a precedent, maybe we're setting a precedent that you just can't let your property deteriorate without the consequences of needing to do something about it. I mean, it's this thing is sad. I think the last time they rented rooms was in 1980s when they used to rent rooms out to people. And it's just been, it's been interesting to watch it deteriorate and fall apart. But, but other than that, I think, you know, I think that the town of Sevastopol is, has done a lot of work to bring us to this point. They're asking us to, in a sense, partner with them. They're willing to give us the money back. And to Bob's point, if this shows the junkyard for what it is, then perhaps that is, you know, bringing back the veil and maybe then that's something that we can deal our town of Sevastopol can deal with after this but I would I would vote for it because I think that it it's an eyesore um, the fact that it's here and is so visible and literally is falling apart I, I really think we should 
take the precedent of letting people in door county and all of our visitors know that you cannot just let your place fall apart right this is a policy making decision right here there are eighteen other municipalities in this county that will all they have to do now is declare something a nuisance and then come to the county board and say help us uh, that's taking the responsibility away from the township or the city or the village and what this looked like to me is that this is we're partnering with the township to take on a liability also because in number 13 it says parties submit themselves to original jurisdiction of the circuit court in Door county of door state of wisconsin so it's we're putting the county in position to defend its role in this partnership and this is strictly a local municipality situation the municipalities have the ability to borrow money if they need to to correct this so i will not be in favor of this john i was going to ask a similar question only to grant what is our legal stake in this grant should we decide to go with this policy because the county's contribution uh, involves only uh, money at this point, uh, we wouldn't be incurring any liability for any activities that occurred at the property. And, and kind of rewind to 2005, what we had was an order of, from the court allowing us to raise the structures and uh, impose the cost that we incurred as a special assessment on the property. And where we got for lack of a better phrase, cold feet, is when it was disclosed that there was an underground storage tank and some potential environmental contamination, even with a liability clarification letter from the DNR. Uh, if you disturb the soil, there, there are consequences, and the county made the decision then to back away, and we went back in the court and had the case dismissed without prejudice because we we're concerned with the liability. The way it's structured now is we don't have any of that liability. Our only liability is the $30,000 we're contributing to the town for their efforts. We're not going to be involved on the ground. So. Is there, uh, Grant, is there still a raise order in place then? regarding this new uh, look at it, I guess we're looking at, uh, has the town of Sevastopol received a raise order from a court? Well, the town of Sevastopol uh, imposed a raise order. The property owners have a defined period of time. It's either 30 or 60 days. I don't remember because the counties don't have that ability. Uh, and if the uh, property owners don't respond, then Sevastopol can proceed. So right now it's in the waiting period where the owner property owner has notice and the ball is in their court to decide whether they're going to act or not and how they act will decide how and whether they act will, will determine how the town of Sevastopol moves forward. Dave? Um, I'd be willing to say that if you took a survey of every municipality in this county, there at every, every municipality in this state, you would find every one of them have some piece of property that they are not enthusiastic about being on their in their municipality, be it um, brush buildings, roadways, doesn't matter, that are not up to the standards that board holds. That is their responsibility, that is their obligation. To the comment about uh, landowners, um, if they cared about their property, they should pay to have those buildings tore down. Um, I remember reading an advocate when I used to actually read it, about people in the letter to the editors complaining about various buildings throughout this county being in such disarray and how could those landowners feel so, why don't they feel the shame for leaving their buildings look like that? People need to understand, not everybody has the money to tear these buildings down. I, in many cases, it's a hand down property. The landowner got it, passed away, and new landowners have it, and the relatives, and they don't have the money. They live out of the area. This is something that if we, this is, this is unique. We do not normally go and partner with the removal of property and then charge the landowner for that service um, when we don't have that authority. Um, I can think of quite a few of them, and somebody mentioned Carlsville. One of the easiest ways would it be, to, based on what I heard about that house, <coughs> in theory we could have torn down that building by the same definition we're using today. And as far as uh, helping to sell the property, <coughs> it is nearly 40 acres. It is in a prime spot with one exception of a local activity that might interfere with resale uses. But um, people tear down buildings all the time in support of their project. 
this is not an unusual event. And 60000 is not a bad expense if they get the price property right to tear it down themselves and take care of it. That is a business decision on the economics of buying it. Right now, apparently, the owners are technically uh, not in default. We have lots of landowners. Anybody that sits on finance knows we have lots of landowners that are two years out on their taxes. That is the way a lot of people operate. Um, I, have a, I have difficulty doing this, and I'm not going to vote in favor of it. Minnie. Um, Grant, do you know this as far as, or yeah, I've, been, I've read this obviously, but does this include the soil remediation that's required by the DNR, this cost? Is that in, in factored into this at all? But I'm wondering how you can remove buildings without disturbing soil. And if you're disturbing soil, how do you not remediate it? Yeah. Those, those would have to be questions that were directed to the town because I wasn't involved in getting the estimates. Or, yeah. So. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Linda. <laughs> Okay, well, I think some of my fellow supervisors have uh, expressed it very well why we should do this, so uh, I appreciate those comments. Um, I can answer several of the questions. Yes, the town has proceeded to obtain a raise order pursuant to our building inspection code and our attorney. We have an order issued. It is out for service. I, was, I believe it has been served upon the parties last week. They do have 30 days to respond. And what happened? The next step after that, we will reach out to our attorney and follow um, their instructions. The um, taxes are two years delinquent. Yes, they're nominal uh, because it's zoned ag or undeveloped or um, whatever. So the taxes are nominal, but they are two years delinquent. Is that an indication that these property owners are going to abandon it anyway? I'm not sure. Um, with regard to the underground tank, we are working with the state, the DATCAP. They were out there, I believe, last summer um, to look at the tank area, and they will be out, um, according to my emails, with uh, a person at DATCAP. They will continue that investigation and site observation this spring when the snow is gone. Uh, with the town, as Mr. Wolfel mentioned, the town did obtain a waiver of liability also from DATCAP and or the DNR. Uh, we had to pay a fee. Um, our demo uh, estimates include demolition to ground level, to the foundation. We do not anticipate disturbing any soil in and around that um, underground tank, which I believe is in front of one of the barns, which we are not touching. It's not a, our intent to touch the barns. It's three homes, three houses, severely dilapidated, haven't been occupied for I don't know how many years. Uh, an old trailer that literally has trees growing through it and a garage that's barely standing. So I don't know if we wanted to ask Mr. Wolfel for any rebuttal on this. Or? Bob? Um, so just to clarify, did I hear you right that the, the, the owner just got the raise order like this week or recently? Yes, served that, last week. Okay, February and then they have 30 days to do something about it. So I mean, so it is possible the owner could do something about it. Next, I mean, they could, could act on your raise order soon within that, that 30 days. That would be fantastic. Yeah. would love nothing more than that, I'm just believe me. <laughs> pointing out the possibility that they may be taking care of it. Maybe this is their final wake or their wake-up call. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it seems like there's maybe still some questions out there. They've been non-responsive for years. I understand. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add? I guess uh, I hear some of the comments regarding <laughs> precedent setting <clears throat> and being on the town board. I think I mentioned this once before. You have to take everything at its own merits and decide on a case-by-case -case basis. So I understand that as Dan Austed mentioned, at some point in time, maybe not all of us are here and somebody can bring that issue back and say back in 19 or 2020, somebody approved that. But you also have historical files and information you can refer to. So <clears throat> I think you can certainly take a second look at that and say, well, here were the circumstances. They were unique in terms of what's up. As far as the building goes, um, we're kind of basically following up with what the county started. We're just trying to clean up an eyesore that I think plays a pretty big role in what tourists think of our community. 
Sebastopol and Door County as they drive by these things and they ask why not. I could tell you all the times I took telephone calls from the people that own the mill, the Mill Supper Club. They were not very pleased with the fact that we were unable to move that. Uh, the fellow that opened the uh, cheese factory across from Wood Orchard and Egg Harbor, uh, he would have located in our town had those buildings not been there. Now, our budget isn't that extensive. We, over two years, have put money aside to try and take those buildings down, and we will get them down, whether it's now or five years from now, one by one. So our approach was just simply to try and solicit a partnership. We're willing to pay you back the money first um, to try and get as much of that cleaned out. The, the reason we didn't include the barn <clears throat> was at least structurally it, you know, could pass as something that's rural setting and however you want to phrase it. People do stop and paint, photograph, et cetera, et cetera. But the rest of the buildings, there's just absolutely nothing there of any value and they're falling into themselves. So we thought it would clean up the area, make a difference in the community. So that was really our intent, trying to move forward. Uh, we'll get them, I'll get them done one way or the other if it's five, six, seven years. But uh, if you want to help us get them done sooner, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. John? Do we know the structural soundness of the barn? Why we would, other than for an artistic value on the outside, how, how is it structurally compared to the other uh, buildings? We haven't really gone into the barn. Um, we believe that it's reasonably solid in terms of what's standing there. Um, and so we haven't really gone into that particular portion of the property. Linda. I did have a solution for the barns. Two giant barn quilts. <laughs> and I might be serious about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might be enough just to pull it down. <laughs> Well, I think as finance, a number of supervisors mentioned properties in their town that they thought some people may like to see cleaned up. Uh, this is, seems that there's extra emphasis put on it because it's the gateway to the, the Door County or the byways. Uh, I mentioned the Nemora Historic District. It's a national landmark in the towns of Union, Gardner, and I believe into Brussels a little bit. That was designated 30 years ago. Many of those homesteads are now falling down, much like this. Are we going to clean those up too? I mean, you know, that's an important site too. There's many visitors that travel that area every year. I, I think you can't simply say we're not setting a precedent because someone's going to come asking for their particular situation and expect help. Vinny. I'm not sure if this is a question that can be answered, but I know in other municipalities when they have a community project that's of value, they put it to their voters or they put it to another format of raising the funds to do that. Has any efforts been made to do that? Or is it that in 15 years 25000 was raised or is it ever put into their budget as a town, you know, to, to deal with this? Um. We have a capital improvement project fund program, you know, so we have, yes, we have been yeah. setting money aside. Um, we recently updated our comprehensive plan and, of course, the comments were, what can we do about cleaning up on-sightly buildings? So we have, it's not a spur of the moment thing like uh, Mr. Wolfel said, we've been working on this um, since the county initiated, initiated it back in 2005. So we're following through with what the county started. Dan? I'd like to clarify something. I don't really think the county started this before. When Leo was chairman of the county board and he was chairman of the town, he was the one that started it. It really wasn't a county's initiative to start it. It was Leo coming forward to try to get the county done. And we turned it down at that time for two big reasons. And one of them is covered is the pollution prospect and also the precedent setting, that's why I got turned down then. I think David was along here when that happened too. Thank you. Okay. Um, Linda, maybe you'd answer this, but you mentioned that the tank was right near the barn, which I guess leaving the barn would create less land disturbance around the tank. Is that some of the thought for leaving the barn? Is that um, well, like, like we indicated, the demo is to take 
the residential structures down to the foundation <coughs> and not touch it. I mentioned that the tank is probably <coughs> right in front of the barn, so we do not intend to touch that area. Okay. So. Thank you. And we do have our, like I mentioned, yeah. and Mr. Wolf will mention, we do have our waiver when it comes to that underground tank and yeah. I'm pretty certain that DAC camp will be dealing with that this spring. Can you explain to us what the waiver is? I don't have it in front of me. Um, Mr. Wolfel could address that. Basically, there's a process with the DNR uh, that we went through uh, to obtain what they call a no liability letter. It specifically states that as long as we leave the area where the fuel tank is untouched, uh, we have permission from the DNR to individually take down those buildings either once or and leave uh, at, at grade, uh, not go below grade. I specifically uh, asked as well that, I mean, the issue some people brought up, well, you go in there with a truck and you disturb the ground and you're liable, and that's not the case, and that's addressed in the document. So, <coughs> Thank you. Roy, did you have? No. Okay. John. I can think of a few other situations in the county that'd be more than willing to jump on this bandwagon and have the county get involved with them. Situation down south where we put a fence up so they couldn't see it. But we could get the county to help us eliminate that situation. It would be of great value. Here we go. Sorry, Linda, but <laughs> deeper pockets. <laughs> okay. One more question. Yep, John. <clears throat> I realize this looks like it's coming out of the contingency fund, as everybody wishes to call it, and then we talk about the special projects expense account. How does money get put into that, and we don't have it sitting in there now for something like this? Do we always just take from one account to feed the other account to do a project such as this, or should we be planning in the future for other projects to pop up uh, so we're not constantly going back to our so-called contingency fund? Well, again, it, it, well, in, if I understand your question correct, so in this case, it came forward as a request, and we obviously we did not budget for it within our regular budget process so that's why we would recommend taking it out of contingency you know should the county board instruct me to set up a a fund that would be available for future related projects we could do that but i would not put a significant amount of money aside because that's just i'm not i'm not sure how active we'd use or make those funds dave just a reminder as well, we keep talking about the $30,000 and putting it against a, a, a tax aspect. We were reminded at finance both times not to basically treat these this $30,000 as if it's going to go away. If we get money back, great. But remember, the property owner can contest a special assessment as well, and they could be tied up in court forever and never end up seeing any money out of it. So I'm not saying that. I just want to make sure people understand, don't plan on seeing these monies come back to the county. I, I would just add to that without an assessment of what the cost of dealing with the tank and the land disturbance pollution issue is, that would change the assessed value of the property potentially. I don't know to what, but if you were a landowner looking at that and having to deal with that, that would impact your cost of the whole piece of land. So kind of to the same point of knowing the return, it's that there's another factor out there that's unknown, I guess. Yeah. Uh, my one question is the... So the landowners have been unresponsive for a while. Well, how long is a while? When was the last time they did have any response to any contact? Um, looking at my seven-page timeline, um, <laughs> you can give me cliff notes <laughs> estimate. That's fine. Well, I can honestly say that in May of 2018, um, there was a gentleman that was interested in reclaiming the barn lumber. You know these barn right. uh, reclamation would, yeah. and um, I put him in touch with the last phone number and address that we had for the air, and he got back to me and said she did not respond um, at all to his in inquiry. 
so I guess 2018, but um, earlier, I believe in about 2015, 2014, we actually did get a response by email when we talked about um, working together with the owner to try to do something with these buildings. Um, again, when it got to the dollar um, discussion, no <coughs> response. Is that correct? If I might. Uh, sure. Go ahead. I talked personally with her on, on numerous occasions, trying, trying to get her to cooperate with us. Um, I approached her both on the uh, Door County byways aspect. Uh, we sent her uh, information on the byways. Uh, on the town, uh, we we also had uh, a book put together for the town sesquicentennial. So we tried to show her how the buildings played into that. Uh, she gave me indications that she was going to follow up and give us a release to go on site to examine the fuel tank. Uh, she was going to address these issues, but after multiple conversations, she decided to do nothing and no longer responded to us. The last time that we physically talked to her. Not me, but our attorneys uh, uh, talked to her when we went to court um, to assign the, the uh, what's the word I want, to make her officially the heir. Uh, she called the court, uh, she called our attorney and discussed that. Uh, again, nothing else with respect to the buildings other than that she knew that she was going to be designated as the heir and she was not going to contest that. So. Okay. Um, I just look back, um, you, there's questions on this underground um, uh, tank, and I'm looking at a memo from June of 2019, like I said last summer. Um, today we, this is from um, DATCAP at the state level. Today we inspected the site and located the tank. We are preparing a referral to the Wisconsin Department of Justice for noncompliance with the underground tank. So whatever happens to that, day, to that tank, that's going to be on the owners of the property. I don't think the town is going to get involved with that tank at all. They will be de dealing strictly with the owners of the property. Time to go to the voter board. Yeah. Could we just clarify, the motion is to support, correct? Yes. Motion to support. We do need a super majority. We need, we need two thirds. 14. 14 votes. Ready? Okay. Let's see if this works. Hmm. All right, who jinxed us? New battery's going to work. Sam. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> Uh-oh, now mine is... <laughs> <laughs> There we go. That's failed in a vote of nine yes, 12 no. Okay. Thank you. Resolution 2020-16, Youth Apprenticeship Program Transfer of Non-Budgeted Funds. David. <coughs> I'm sorry. It's all right. It's on page 63. Yes. My mind is still on the last resolution. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I went too far. There you go. Okay, I'll make a motion to to pass resolution 2020-16 for the Youth Apprenticeship Program. Second. The money would come from non-budgeted funds in the amount of not to exceed uh, twenty-four thousand. Sure. So again, just for context, just so you know what we're using those funds for, it is because there was some confusion that we're actually giving the funds to DC EDC. That is not the case. What we're looking at here today is actually uh, the youth apprenticeship program is actually looking for uh, businesses throughout Door County to actually make opportunities available for youth to apply for positions. And what we did is uh, we made a presentation to the admin committee in terms of the program, uh, and they had um, provided some initial support 
in terms of trying to pursue that for our organization. And then we worked with our department heads to identify potential areas or positions that might be available for the youth internships. Uh, we have identified um, five positions, I guess, for this first go around with, I guess, my goal is to see that potentially grow in the future. But uh, we have five opportunities defined. And again, we had talked about it in terms of the funding for that, and it would be up to $24,000. And again, these would be individuals that are <coughs> our students or youth that are working for our organization, hopefully contributing and learning as well. And so I think it's a, um, a good program to, I guess, invest ourselves into. David, a, a clarification, just so people understand, this is um, because we're a governing body, if I understand this correctly, because we're a governing body rather than a private business and the way we do our budgeting for monies, that's why this is here in the first place. Um, unlike, say, Thermotronics that offers to take in youths to work within their business, they, that's their business decision. This is how we have to support that same concept. As an employer, employee children, children, uh, young adults within this program system, that's how, why it's here before us, is to provide those monies in order to be able to participate in that program. That's correct. Helen? Well, just to clarify a little bit, um, I did go to the last um, employee um, information group and there were um, probably 30 employers, 30 to 40 employers there from up and down the county who were very interested. This is actually hiring young people. This isn't just an internship or um, an unpaid position where you follow someone around. They are actually going through the process of, of hiring the youth and then working out with the youth um, what the hours of operation will be. They're able to work full time in the summer. So they're actually hired on as an employee. And um, they have, um, they work with someone up front, but actually um, when they're hired, they're hired through their HR department, they're hired and um, you have to give them a little extra, maybe assistance because they are high school kids. Um, and it gives kids an opportunity to work, not only in trades, but we have um, kids working in accounting that are interested in accounting in all, all areas of, um, of our business and hospitality and healthcare work. So one of the ideas is to actually be able to give kids an opportunity to work if they desire to. Um, and the other one is to try to keep our youth home by um, in their county by showing them what's available and kids are able to change if they start out in accounting and that's what they don't like they're able to change um, but it's a, been a very successful program in in um, Dora and Kiwani County we start tried to start something like this in the past and it kind of fell through but um, the the um, number of kids that are interested and the number of businesses that are interested have really really impressed me um, so it is something that people are looking at seriously. Yes, sir. Um, I personally love programs like this. Uh, back when I was in high school, which was last week, um, my my best friend had a baby a month before she turned 16, and she did a youth apprentice, apprenticeship work study type of program, and that was what made it able for her to graduate high school. Um, without that, she could have been easily a negative statistic. <clears throat> Instead, she was able to go to school, also work, and be able to afford bills that a typical teenage kid doesn't necessarily have. You know, is it ideal for every kid out there? Of course not, but most things are an ideal for every kid out there. For her, though, it, it kept her in school, she and I graduated together. Otherwise, she could have easily dropped out because she was a single mom before, well, before most kids are even thinking about, you know, children. Um, so I fully support putting funding into this because of the <coughs> fact that, it, yes, it's anecdotal evidence, but it helps someone that I cared about deeply. Laura? Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, wonderful to see the committee's bringing this forth. Uh, I initiated conversations after DCEDC um, spoke about this uh, apprenticeship program um, and their collaboration with the ANAPI. Uh, so 
many thanks to Jen from the Anope, the Regional Anope Apprenticeship Program and Kelsey Fox at DCEDC for their hard work in bringing this to the county. Um, as workforce, not just in our county, but also our government positions uh, initiated those conversations coming forward. I hope to see this grow. Uh, I know we've had shortages in social workers and human, re human services and also our telecommunications, but we have to work out those details with confidentiality. So um, thank you for everyone that's uh, for the committees that are bringing this forward to the county board today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a question uh, looking under the paragraph fiscal impact. Um, it suggests an estimated $13 per hour. Is that what the student will actually receive or are, will there be other administrative costs in that $13 per hour? Do we, I guess my question is what, what will the students get per hour? There is no there is no overhead cost that's collected by the youth exchange program. We did an estimate at thirteen dollars an hour because we have to build in um, the benefits that we're required to pay. So, for example, we might have to do twelve fifty an hour, but on average, we're just projecting that amount in terms of. Okay, so and that's why we authorized up to the twenty four thousand. But it would pr be pretty close to that amount. Yes, roughly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Helen. I'd just like to restress that these are actually jobs. People have, employers have to pay at least minimum wage, but they're actually um, requesting that employers look at the position and pay the students somewhat equally to what they would do to anybody off the street that they would be hiring. So the difference here is this is actually a job. This is one of the differences in some of the other programs out there. Vinny. I would just add that, and correct me, people who are more involved with this, but it also is run through the school districts. So the school districts have a key role in maintaining the student's eligibility as a student and for graduation. So it's very, you know, through guidance counseling and through direct supervision of the school staff, it is part of high school as well. So it, it's really matched well with that as an apprentice program, I feel. Yeah. Dave? Um, not knowing anybody else's past history in high school. Mm -hmm. um, Back in my days in high school, my uh, high school had a similar set of programs. They're called DECA and VICA. VICA, I remember, because I was a participant in that. Vocational Industrial Clubs of America. Uh, they are both nationwide. Uh, DECA was the business version of it, the accounting and so forth. Um, to, there was a public comment that during the beginning of how we shouldn't be taking children out of school. Um, in my reading of the information provided for this program, it's very similar to my VEC the VICA that I participated in. You had to have a certain grade level. You had to participate in the particular class that's associated with it. Uh, you had to have the open hours relative to your class. You had to uh, participate appropriately with the business. It is a job. You are hired as an employee. You qualify all, for all the activities that happen at that business. A um, little different here because we do have some of the seasonal aspects of it, but down in Germantown, these were industrial plants everywhere. Um, our difficulty was it is an excellent opportunity to get children out into the real world of what they're thinking of doing. Uh, you can be great in architectural you know, uh, drafting, which is where I went in through it, uh, and find you absolutely hate doing that in real life. <laughs> and this is an opportunity I've always believed in, in giving children the opportunity to experience part of what they think they want to be as opposed to what they really should be. Uh, my son, my <coughs> son was the one that participated in the German, the Gibraltar version of this, uh, many years back. Um, it is nothing but a plus. It teaches them other aspects of doing business with individuals. Um, it just works well, and it's it's the only reason it's even here is again because of the nature of who we are as a business. We have to provide funding for it if we choose to hire anybody at all. Um, a little side note in reference to my personal experience with it, our class was the last class where um, the school found those jobs for them because every one of our students got hired, including myself, by the business and the job site <coughs> right up. So now the students had to find their jobs. But it is an excellent opportunity. Dave? Yeah, I, th I think the, you know, the county here would be acting similar to a business and uh, I have Gosh, three grandkids at Southern Door, one to Kakana that have gone through similar programs or are in the process now from manufacturing to retail to, to banking to one applying for you know, going through an interview process, uh, a hospital in, uh, in the valley. So I mean, I, I think it gives kids exposure to things that they might not otherwise have 
while they're in school. Certainly the academics are the most important there, but I think uh, it seems those kids with the, that, that are handling their school academics well are those that are able to enter into these programs. Okay. Anybody else? If not, we will go to the voter board. <laughs> We need 14. Oh, two-thirds. Two-thirds vote. Yeah. Okay. You're just in the wrong spot. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We could virtually buy some batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Bob will just, five feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Closer as we go. Oh, hey. Getting there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to open it. Damn, Niagara's escarpment. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. That's passed the vote of 21. Ooh. Yes, zero, no. Nice. 21 off today. We are going to take a five minute recess, <laughs> but I want to explain <laughs> that we're going to be switching chairs for the moment. Uh, I have a medical appointment I have to leave for in Green Bay. So Ken will finish the balance of the meeting. So five minutes. Is he going to agree with us some more? Because this is crazy. No. Oh, oh. Yeah, use the gavel. Why are we here? They can only get so far. No, they can only get so far. Let's make it count. Oh, that is it. Don't hurt yourself, Ken. Yeah. Wait here. I'm going to get a It's still a lot. got a claim file. Is that real? Yeah, that's real. Yeah, that's real. All right, we have everybody here. I've never seen this before. There, there. I need Joe to get back. Of course. No, no. Uh, we don't worry about that. I can vote for him. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm in it, right? All right. Let's, let's see. We went to the youth apprenticeship. We took the vote on that, correct? Correct. 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 All right. We'll go to uh, we'll go to resolution 202017. Uh, have a motion on that. Like motion me. to approve resolution 2020-17. Okay, and second. I second that. Second by Bob. All right. Any uh, questions on that? I can do Anybody a, need an explanation on it? Oh. Would you like an explanation? Well, nobody raised their hands. We don't need an explanation. Okay. <laughs> oh, John needs an explanation. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Oh, good. I don't quite understand it. Okay. We're uh, eliminating a position. To create one. And we're and we're hiring a position. I'm making a supervisor out of it. Sure. So, I'll, yep, I can explain the process. So what happened is we had a vacancy or a position that became open. And in that area, what they did is they did analysis because they had, um, I guess, some significant turnover over the past year in the amount of experience within that division. And Joe is here, he can provide more detail. But in essence, what we're looking, and when they did that analysis, they determined that they actually needed uh, a working supervisor position to be created to help provide support for the existing staff. So if you're looking at it from a straight org chart standpoint, we're actually eliminating uh, one position, which would be the elimination of a, <coughs> this is a social worker. So that's coming <coughs> off the org chart, but then on the org chart, we're gonna add back in a social worker supervisor. So they're gonna be doing both supervisory work plus also work related to the operations. That's my question. If you take a worker out of the workforce and make them a supervisor, supposedly you're even number of people. But now you don't have a person in the workforce. <coughs> so you're going to have to replace that person in the workforce. If you don't want to replace that person in the workforce, then the work person in the workforce wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> <coughs> so that was actually discussed both at admin and also at finance. And Joe was very transparent in that based off the caseload, their, their cases have gone up significantly. I think it was over 113 cases additional from last year. Um, so again, he's not promising that through the budget process he might not, he might ask for uh, future staff. I think he's being very transparent on that, but it's just one of those things where 
We also need to have the support for the staff that we have to ensure that we're handling those cases properly. <laughs> so it's it's one of those situations where we have to, I guess, provide the right supervision for the staff to properly conduct their work. Um, hopefully that with these individuals, if you get in the proper supervision, that you also can help them with their caseload and also avoid burnout because this is one of those areas where we have significant <coughs> turnover. So again, it's just one of those things where we're trying to balance what we need in terms of our, I guess, management and resources, but also the understanding that, yes, this is an area where we're starting to see more and more, I guess, cases that we're responsible for treating. So yes, uh, we're being very transparent that this might be an area where you will see that position asking to be replaced. I know, Joe, if you would like to add anything, but. If there are questions, I'd be glad to. You covered it well. Alexis? I would just clarify that it was mentioned that this would be a working supervisor, so they would oversee the foster care program. Is that part of it? Yeah. So it is a working position as well. It's not just supervisor. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Linda? Um, in the memo on page 66, it does indicate that the financial impact is nearly $10,000 going from a worker to a supervisor. So just remember that next year's budget might include a request to refill the vacant position that was just or the eliminated position mm -hmm. plus another 10 perhaps 15,000 to support the supervisor position Laura? thank you thank you uh, so the county and the state as a whole is seeing uh, issues with child protective services and needing a funding for it we've lobbied on this issue worked with Wisconsin County's <coughs> Association and as we move forward in the next year in budgeting, we got to get creative on how to address this shortage and turnovers. So I will be supporting this, and uh, we have to use our minds and get creative on how to address this and this increased caseload. Thank you. Anybody else? Nice. Go ahead, kind please. of just repeating what um, Laura just mentioned. I think it's a, a great need. It's of high importance, and I definitely support it. So. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then go to the voter board. She's gonna make a man. Right. You're gonna cancel right. it. Just, yeah. You have to tell you what I'm voting. <laughs> you didn't have to worry about it. Because <laughs> oh, good, I get to change so. my mind. She's adding time to the meeting. I think. You gotta do it again. <laughs> oh, did you? Why do we? That was a resolution. Yeah. So that's take care. Of, now we're ready to go. Yes. yes. Thank you. So now right, we're ready Bob. to vote. You got in early. <laughs> I don't really vote off tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is it. I'll just leave it there. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Okay, so that passes uh, 17 to 3 no, with one absent. Other than obvious. All right. 2020-18 salaries of elective officials. Would you like to explain that right away? Sure. Get a motion for that first. I'll make a motion. Or by it. Alexis, second by Nancy. Thank you. Okay, as far as the explanation, uh, we're required to set the salaries for our elected officials. Um, again, we have, based off the sets, they're rotating on a four-year cycle. So the one cycle that is upcoming now is the Register of Deeds, the County Clerk, and the Treasurer. What you have before you is a resolution that was supported by the Administrative Committee. And you'll see is you'll see the, the wages that are established <coughs> for the 2020 rate that they are now than the recommended rates for 21, 22, 23, and 24. I guess the one thing that you'll see, I guess, as a difference uh, from what we've done in the past is that we have now <coughs> recommended to the admin committee <coughs> distinguishing between the register of deeds and the county clerk and the treasurer position. Again, what's included in your packet, um, just in terms of the logic of what we have put together for you, if you go to page 68, um, what we do is we are trying to align the position somewhat with our pay plan. 
And if you look on page 68, you can kind of see with our comparable counties that we use for our previous wage studies where we stand. So for example, if you're looking at that chart, <coughs> we'll look at the registered deeds, which is in the blue. In 2017, they were at a rank of 11th compared to our other counties. And then in 2020, they remained 11th. So in short, it says that we're, we stayed pretty much status quo over those past four years. Likewise, though, we did go forward, and then we also, if you go then all the way to the right, we actually looked at it compared to our, our pay plan. And what we're trying to do, okay. Row two. Um, what we try to do is we look at our pay plan, and what you'll see there is you'll see, uh, just an example, I'll take the, the top box, the grade K. In essence, what happened with the elected positions, the top half of the box, is that they remained at about 92.4% of their pay plan. So in other words, although they had increases, they did not grow um, anywhere within the pay plan itself. It remained kind of flat. Likewise, though, if you compare it to our GMEs, uh, someone that would have been at 100% in 2017 actually grew within a pay plan to about 105.4%. So again, they got increases, but we also aged the plant, so there was some, some changes in terms of the wages themselves. So long story short, we looked at that. We're trying to find out that balance of where they fit. From our standpoint, our, what I kind of discussed at the administrative committee, it, it makes sense for us to kind of align the positions within our pay plan. So if you look at then page uh, 69 and 70, I guess we're aligning the the clerk and the register deeds within our, uh, what we consider the gray, I mean, not the, the grade of K. And then the treasurer would be aligned with the grade of a J in terms of our pay plan. And I think moving forward, what our goal, what I had talked about with your support would be, in essence, try to keep them within the control point. It's going to vary depending on what we do with the plan, but in general, if we can keep them within that control point of those grades, I think we can say that we're being uh, fair to those individuals in those positions. So with that, that was the recommendation that was put forward. Um, if you're wondering <coughs> in terms of the percentages, uh, for the registered deeds and county clerk, just to get them to that portion, it it's ends up being a 5%, then a 2%, 2%, 2% for those years. And then for the treasurer, it ends up being a 1%, 2%, 2%, 2%. And that's what we presented at the, at the committee, and that's what's before you today. And I don't know if there's any questions, but I could ask or clarify if you'd like. <coughs> no questions? Okay, then to the voter board. Maybe. Well, then I'll ask questions. Do you include okay. David? Okay. Oh, no, it's the way not Joel. All right, that passes, uh, uh, what, 19 to uh, 20. 21 excused. <coughs> All right. And uh, let's see. Oh, the annual report of gifts, <coughs> grants, and donations. That's just an FYI. It's included in your, uh, was it, uh, Lori had provided a hard copy for you. It's also online. Any questions on that? No. Okay, then Coastal Byway Program, letter of support. Uh, I can give you some context. Uh, if you recall, last month we had a presentation on a group that's working on that. Uh, they had then followed up with David in terms of trying to get this a letter of support. Uh, you'll see within the packet a sample letter that was put together. Um, I believe that letter is from the Village of Sister Bay. What David was looking for is this a, a motion of support uh, from the county board floor that we would draft a similar type letter and that he would sign that letter and submit it. Okay, so we can take that motion now. Correct, if you'd like. Respect. Correct. I'll Do make, we have a motion on that, Linda? Um, I would make a motion that we support um, the Door County Coastal Byways efforts um, in their application for All American Road and or National Scenic Byway. I am on the Coastal Byway Council and uh, this is something that we have been thinking about um, and we would certainly appreciate 
the county support along with any municipalities that wish to support um, to submit a letter. And okay, I'll Laura, that. you want to second it? Okay. Thank you. All right, any questions or comments on that one? All right, do we need to go to the board on that? Just take a no, voice vote. Voice, voice. Just a voice, voice vote, excuse me. Yeah. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. All right. Uh, Got to go back up a bullet point. What? Go to 13, second bullet point on 13. It was tabled. That was tabled. Was tabled. Oh, it just tabled completely? Yep. Yeah. Ah. yep. That's all. My apologies. Uh, no problem. Uh, keep me on my toes just in case. Yeah. <laughs> and we're also canceling uh, uh, on 14 e evaluation process for county administrator. Uh, Mr. Lena wants to be here for that, so we'll do that next time. <clears throat> Let's see, nothing else is missed. Oral <coughs> committee reports. Any oral committee reports? I have one. At RPC the other night, we had a short meeting. Short. <laughs> Eight and a half hours taking uh, 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 testimony. 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 <laughs> testimony. Thank you. Uh, from the I two sides. I know you were asleep, perhaps. I was. I was dozing off. Uh, for eight and a, almost eight and a half hours, and uh, we canceled or we postponed the, the. We went to the business meeting, and then we postponed any decision until tomorrow at one o'clock. We, we we set up another uh, uh, committee meeting where we will decide on the fate of the RV park. All right, if I may, Chairman. What is that, Vice Chair? A comment. Yes. Not only did we have the eight hours, many of us have well over 20 hours in, re in reading the documents, the 1,400 plus pages of documents, and I was really quite impressed with the pre presentations done and the participants within the audience. They actually did quite well for a fairly contentious item. They were, according <coughs> to all the rumors we kept hearing about it, they were they were uh, well prepared and they were uh, orderly. Yes. Okay. Any other? No other uh, oral committee reports? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not really a committee report, but hearing nothing from the highway, I just want to make a comment here at the meeting. I talked to a couple members from the highway committee. Uh, the towns in Southern Door are certainly upset with the snow plowing in the last two snowstorms, especially the one where when the person in charge of busing contacted the highway shop, said they'd be, the roads would be open within a couple hours. So they delayed school two hours. They sent the buses out only to find the roads weren't nearly open. Five buses encountered stuck vehicles on the roadway. They had picked up students. They had to return to the school. Parents had dropped off kids at school anticipating a 10 o'clock start. Uh, they need more accurate information they coming out of the highway. You can't do that with kids. John, do you want to respond to that at all? My phone you don't have been, to. My phone has been going off to hook. And I agree with it 100%. And you've been with me on this issue before, Mr. Fisher. You want to comment on it? I'm getting tired of it. That's all I'll say right now, but we are going to have to. Thank you for It's going to have to be I'm seriously not, addressed. I'm not on the committee, but I need to bring that information forward. Yep, yep. It's good that you did it. Bring it out here where everybody can hear it. Go ahead, Dave. If I may make a comment on that result, um, Town of Big Harbor had at least one road that was not touched for a day and a half. That was a town road, so I don't know if you're referring to just county roads or all roads. All roads, but the, yes. They, they plowed up, turned left, and that was the end of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's why we have four-wheel drive. Yeah, that's what we all have. Joel, did you have something? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, moving on. Review kit committee minutes. Any questions on those? No. Uh, vouchers, claims, and bills? Yes, Linda. I had two questions. On page 107 uh, from EMS, what is a cable machine? Uh, $2,039. And then also on page 110, Beeson <coughs> Asphalt for $11,525. I meant to ask ahead of time last week and I forgot. Anybody know? Beeson. What is a cable machine? Beeson's Black, that must be for snow plow, snow plowing or something. Beeson's uh, snow plowing. Yeah. Do we are, they, subcontract with Beeson? Yes, they okay. do like our lot here and everything. They do our snow, plow, snow removal okay. here and also at the uh, 
community center. Okay. What was the other one? I'm sorry. Uh, cable machine on page 107. Cable yeah. machine, 2039 EMS. I'm not aware what that one is. Joel? You, I don't know. I didn't text you? when we were reviewing them. I, was, I left immediately okay. this time, so I don't All right. So you will look into that I'll and look get into back that. to it? Yes, I'll okay. get back to you on that. Okay. Announcements. Next regular county board meeting will be March 24th at 10 a.m. yet? Just so, actually, I won't, I, please excuse me right now. I will be out of town, so you can have it earlier at 9 o'clock if you would like. Go back to resuming normal time. And excuse me, because I will not be there. Okay. Uh, Your call. Make it nine. What is it? We could make. I can make it nine, and if Dave wants to change it, he can change it and let you all know. I mean, it's a month right. from now. Yep. So, but it, does that work out for everybody going back to nine o'clock? It can be nine the whole rest until next winter again, though. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. So it'll be March twenty fourth at nine a.m. <clears throat> all right. Door County Medical Center 75th Anniversary Tour Invite, March 12th, 2020 at 6 p.m. I take it that's an FYI open to anybody. Yes, and that, and just so you know, David did authorize that. We'll be noticing it as a quorum of the county board, so you can claim it, not as a county board meeting, but you can claim it as a meeting expense if you attend. Mr. Chair? Yes. We have to RSVP for that, do we not? I yeah. mean, on the mm -hmm. notice. Yes, if you got the notice, they appreciate that because they, they would like to know the count. Right. So if you do plan to attend, please notify them. Okay. All right. Meeting for DM code 522. Mr. Chairman, if I may make a motion to adjourn. I would appreciate Vice that. Vice Chair. Second. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. And we are adjourned. Thank, Thank you, one and all. Being that the normal person is not available.